Hello and welcome to the Claw Studio here at the Royal Opera House and to this Insight Evening supported by Rolex. I'm Flora Wilson and tonight we'll be exploring <laughs> tonight we'll be exploring a piece that had its world premiere right here at Covent Garden over 270 years ago. Today it's celebrated as the final masterpiece of George Frederick Handel. This is the biblical story of Jephthah, who goes into battle promising God that if he's victorious, he'll sacrifice the first living being he meets on his return home. He returns triumphant, but who should he meet but his own daughter? This is, surprise, surprise, a piece that puts difficult questions of faith and sacrifice center stage. By the time Handel composed Jephthah, he'd written over 40 operas and numerous oratorios, including The Messiah. He was wealthy, he was famous, he was widely respected. He was also in his late 60s, and his vision was gradually failing him. In fact, by the time he completed Jephthah, he couldn't really see at all, and he would die only five years later. But what a legacy this piece is. It'll be returning to the main stage here at the Royal Opera House on the 8th of November in a brand new production by director of opera Oliver Mears and conducted by Baroque specialist Lawrence Cummings. It's an all-star, mainly British cast, headed up by Alan Clayton in the title role, supported by Jennifer France, Brindley Sherratt and others. Well, this evening, we'll be going behind the scenes of this new production. I'll be speaking to Ollie and to Lawrence, as well as to members of the cast. But first, to get us in the mood, please welcome soprano Sarah Dufresne and repetitor Edward, repetitor Edward Reed to Reeve to perform Tune the Soft Melodious Lute. Oh, 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 oh,
Thank you so much, Sarah and Edward, for that delightful introduction to the music of Handel. You just tell, he can just spin that melody out of almost nothing, isn't it? Just a masterclass in how to write a tune. Really beautiful stuff. Well, now we've had a taste of Handel's score, let's hear some more about the man behind the oratorio. For that, please join me in welcoming one of the country's really great Handel experts. We're delighted to have Dr Ruth Smith from the University of Cambridge. Thank you, Flora. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening. Um, the story was given you in a nutshell by Flora, um, but I thought that I should start by telling you a bit more about what happens in this work, though I'm sure many of you have heard it before. But just as a reminder, the story is actually taken from the oldest account of the fight for possession of land in the Middle East. So right now, it has terribly topical reverberations. But can I ask you to try to clear current events from your minds and to consider what the story meant when Thomas Morell wrote the libretto, when Handel set it to music, and when the Covent Garden audience of Handel's day listened to it. The story is from the Old Testament of the Bible, the sacred text of the majority of Handel's audience. And so they were very engaged by it because it was topical for them too. And I'd like to spend some time thinking about how and why. But first the story, just as a reminder. Uh, Jephthah is the son of Gilead, who is the leader of an Israelite tribe, the Gileadites, who are occupying the promised land which God has given to them. But Jephthah is born out of wedlock, and after his father's death, he is exiled by his half-brothers. However, being a valiant commander, he is invited back to lead the Gileadites when their enemies, the Ammonites, threaten to annihilate them. Jephthah accepts the command, and correctly, he attempts to negotiate with the Ammonites, but to no avail. And I'll now continue the story with the text of the authorised version of the Bible, which our librettist and composer worked from. This is what the Bible says. Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the Ammonites into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And Jephthah came again unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dancers. And she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, Thou hast brought me very low, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth, inasmuch as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies. And she said unto her father, Let this thing be done for me, 
Let me alone two months that I may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity, I and my followers. And he said, go. And he sent her away for two months and she went with her companions and bewailed her virginity upon the mountains. And it came to pass at the end of two months that she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed. This is all that the Bible says about the relationship of Jephthah and his daughter, who you will see is not even given a name. He did with her according to his vow has generally been taken down the centuries to mean that he killed her. Among believers in the Jewish and Christian God, the implications of this have been agonized over since the very beginnings of biblical commentary. Here are God and man apparently endorsing human sacrifice as the seal and the outcome of religious vow. How can this be reconciled with the idea of a loving, redemptive God, a God whose laws forbid human sacrifice? And how can it be reconciled with the listing in the Christian New Testament of Jephthah as one of the Old Testament figures who will be saved because of their faith? Now, in Handel's England, this story was newly problematic because it was being given new prominence in the intense Enlightenment debates about the validity of the Bible and of Christianity as promulgated by the established church. After all, Isaac Newton had shown that the universe was set in motion according to the laws of mathematics, not by a providence concerned in the fate of every human being. And ethics were supplanting religious faith. And here was an undeniable example of Jehovah's appalling ethical standards. Yet Christianity was based in the Old Testament in its prophecies of a Messiah. It couldn't just be written off if one hoped to be saved in the life to come. And in Handel's England, and I do want to stress this to you, religion was no esoteric side issue. It was a matter of identity and even of livelihood. You couldn't, for example, hold public office uh, as an MP or in the church or in the military or in a university, uh, unless you took communion in the Church of England and had a certificate to prove you'd done it. Moreover, the British, in common with many societies of the time, identified politically with the Old Testament Israelites. They felt themselves to be God's chosen people now, as the Jews were then. So, unsurprisingly, the story of Jephthah was exploited by critics at every level of seriousness to call the fabric of Christian society into question. And Morell and Handel were grasping one of the most painful nettles of the current existential controversy in the most public fashion possible in Covent Garden Theatre. They were not the first to make an oratorio of this story. Uh, you may know the setting by Carissimi. And nearer to home, five years before Handel wrote his version, his rival composer Maurice Green had composed an oratorio on the story of Jephthah. Both these composers had given the story its apparent tragic ending. Without wanting to give the game away and in total ignorance myself of what the production will do, uh, I'll just say that uh, Morel and Handel used a solution to the problem of the vow which exonerated both Jehovah and Jephthah and which rested on a linguistic element of the vow which an angel comes down and explains to Jephthah at the crisis. This was not bizarre. It was a solution that had been current since the Middle Ages, and you can find it even now in modern biblical commentaries. From the point of view of the dramaturgy, the solution is withheld till the final scenes, which allows Handel to give his audience, who knew the Bible story very well, almost two hours of increasing suspense. How would it come out in this version? And in those hours, Handel gives us some of his greatest and most emotive music, exploring a huge range of relationships and emotion, family relationships, parental love, young love, patriotism, leadership, heroism, national identity, warfare, the miraculous, and the nature of God. Whose idea it was to take on this story, Morels or Handel's, we don't know, it would be normal for the idea to have come from the librettist, and there are very good grounds with Jefferth for thinking that this was the case. Thomas Morell, the librettist, was a classicist uh, of some repute and an editor of, amongst others, 
the plays by the Greek tragedian Euripides. And if the name of Iphis makes you think of Iphigenia in the story of the Trojan War, you have the source of the characters that Morel added to the Bible story, Euripides' play Iphigenia and Aulis. It's the same identities and relationships. Jephthah, Agamemnon. Zabel, his brother, Menelaus, Agamemnon's brother. Storge, Jephthah's wife, Clytemnestra. Iphis, Iphigenia. Hamor, her fiancé, Achilles. And these two families are facing the identical crisis, the sacrifice of a daughter apparently needed in the cause of military success. And for Handel, these additional characters uh, and all the characters together, all the soloists together, very conveniently provide for five different vocal registers. But Morel was also a Church of England priest. And in Jephthah, I think, he is justifying the ways of God to man. Whether our production will support him, I don't know. So like Handel's audience, I'm in suspense. Uh, you will have noticed that I referred, I think I referred to this work as an oratorio. And I'd just like to end by saying, which you will know, I'm sure, that Jephthah was not for Morel and Handel in its origins an opera, but an oratorio. Handel didn't write his dramatic oratorios to be staged. He used no sets, no costumes. He did them in what we would now call concert performance. Opera of Handel's day had quite strict conventions of entrances and exits and numbers of characters in a scene. Whereas oratorio in English, which was a genre that Handel and his librettists invented, had far more musico-dramatic freedom. And Jephthah is celebrated for, amongst many other marvels of composition, the great continuous half hour at its center, which involves all five characters and the chorus, and in which reaction is piled on reaction and emotion on emotion. Oratorio is now frequently referred to as opera of the mind because often it gives its listeners the scope to reflect, consider, and make their own interpretations of the motives and reactions of the characters. Whereas in a staged version, we see the reactions of the characters unmistakably conveyed by actor-singers, and the stage director has a very large interpretative role. That is very much the case with the disturbing events of Handel's Jephthah, and finding out what this production will be making of it, especially of its quite open-ended conclusion, uh, will give us, the audience, an added level of suspense. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>Thank you, Ruth. Isn't opera of the mind a wonderful phrase that makes absolute sense of this? And of course, it's no surprise that Old Testament stories have been used again and again in oratorios and in operas alike. They are full of human drama and divine drama. And what more could we possibly want? Well, to tell us more about Jephthah and the rest of the complex characters in this oratorio, I'm joined this evening by several members of the cast. I'm delighted to welcome Alan Clayton, Jennifer France, Cameron Shabazi, and Brindley Sherratt. Please join me in welcoming them now. Thank you all so much. I'm going to try and avoid looking from side to side too much, otherwise we'll all feel seasick. Um, thank you all for being here. You've been in rehearsals today. Um, what are you up to? Brindley, where are you with rehearsals at the moment? We're doing stage piano rehearsals. Um, and what does that mean for those of us who don't spend okay, all the time Okay, so there's no orchestra in the pit. It's just a pianist and the continuo, which accompany us um, in the rest of the teams and also in the arias. Um, and it's really to do with where we are on the stage, making how we are with the set, technically working out where the, can't mention any of it, but we're, we're in the right place at the right time, and, and that we look right in our costumes, and our makeup and hair is all good. So the focus is really on the action on stage, whereas stage orchestras, which come next week, are really, it's over to the conductor, and with them we have to sing properly. All oh, right, exciting times. Am I allowed to ask what you were working on today? Alan, what were you up to? Uh, we were working through Act Two, 
um, which is there's lots of. I mean, again, I'm not sure how much we're allowed to say. I'm just go for it. Yeah, there, there's there's some big moving parts on stage, um, oh. uh, which have the potential to be fatal at the wrong point. Oh well, that's um, always good, isn't it? Exactly. Got to so we're working, some working danger. Exactly, and there's some sort of choreography and some um, some dancing from some of the ladies of the chorus, um, and Jen, and uh, and so we were sort of just going through that slowly <laughs> and, and seeing seeing how it's going to knit together. All right, fabulous. You're actually back here. You, it's not been long since you were here as Peter Grimes. Quite a different opera for you this time, quite a different role. Uh, yeah, he's more... Uh, last time no one liked me, and now they have to pretend to like me. So it's... Uh, and we should say you are playing Jephthah, the title role in this piece, just so we're absolutely yes. clear. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, it, it, very different characters, um, and, but, but still uh, brilliantly led by the chorus, uh, I think, in this, this show. Surprisingly to me, at least, uh, I think they have ten choruses. So even more so, it's their piece. You know, you think of Peter Grimes being a chorus piece, but this one is even more more their their yeah, show. Absolutely, Jennifer, you were also in Grimes, I think, weren't you? I was. Yeah, I was first niece. Um, it was an amazing experience, actually. Um, so it's wonderful to be back and working again with Alan. Always a joy. Always a joy. But yeah, I mean, for me, it's um, again completely different characters. Because um, Ifis is, um, she's kind of the heart of the piece. You know, it's a, it's quite, it's it's quite a stern, cold piece in many ways. And she, I always feel that she's the kind of, the bright light of it. Mm. Um, you know, and she 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 cares for everybody. She's almost got, she takes on this kind of, parent role for everyone. She cares for everybody. She looks after everybody. And then obviously, ultimately, what potentially happens to her is um, is quite shocking at the end. No spoilers. <laughs> we'll see where we get with that. <laughs> I've got to say, I mean, Brindley, you were here again quite recently in Votsek. Yes. Cameron, you were here a matter of weeks ago in the Nord New George Benjamin. Yeah. What is it with Handel combining with <laughs> newer music? Go on, let us in on the secret. They, they just didn't cancel our passes. So we're <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whilst you're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are, more seriously, how different is Handel to sing to some of the later rap that you've all been singing recently? Very different, uh, speaking personally for me. I mean, Wozzeck, with, I think Alan might have said this today, it, when you're doing something like Wozzeck or Grimes or something, there's a lot of things you can do to stretch <coughs> it out dramatically with your voice. Handel, really, you, you, the parameters are much tighter, similar to Mozart in that way, that it, it really has to be quite beautiful. So that's the big challenge for me, uh, <laughs> is that... Um, uh, y y that it's, for I find it an incredible discipline, but it's, it's like going back to school and having to, you know, I can't just come down the front and bellow. You know, I have to sing tastefully and... Um, Completely unlike all your other performances. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really, I'm not doing myself any favors here, am I? But no, it, uh, but it's, it is wonderful though to sing in English. I'm a big fan of singing in English because there's an immediate connection between what we're saying and immediate with the audience. It's not like they have to look up at the subtitles. But I'm Although like, with you they are still. Oh, they are, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because my diction is not great. Um, uh, Cameron, how about you with the... It, sorry. Sorry, no, no, I, I, I've said enough. We couldn't, we couldn't hear from the enunciation whether you were done or not. We're just, yeah, 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 I know. You know not to, how do you find singing in English? Is it, again, is there a kind of an immediacy there for you? Well, I, I enjoy very much singing in English. I, I enjoy singing any language that I'm fluent in or have some basic knowledge of the language. Then I don't feel like a fraud. You know, I, I did that with some of the other languages that we sing in regularly, just to have a basic understanding. But in, regarding the question of the modern music and Baroque music, I have a slightly different experience than Brindley because especially George Benjamin's music, the way he writes for the countertenor voice is quite Baroque. Uh, and you have an immense amount of pressure to be um, on this tightrope singing in, in a way that you are uh, sort of otherworldly, but also uh, uh, very exposed. You know? So there's, there's some similarity uh, to singing George's music, at least or Sir George's music rather, and then and going to uh, the other Georgie. And unlike Brindley, I suppose, you are used to needing to sing beautifully for, um, for George Benjamin. They, they constantly ask me, and I, I'm starting to get offended by the reminders. No, one, I suppose the music does inspire. You just listen to the orchestration or you listen to the music and you join that world. And so the world that George in Picture Day Like This or Renan Skinner, they, they are... Um, 
they demand it and you're exposed. And similar to Handel, um, you are led by this pure and honest emotion. Um, and the characters that I've had the, the chance to, to work on are um, lovers. And so they require an honesty or a mm. purity. Okay, let's talk a bit more about these characters in particular then. I mean, we sort of have to start with Jephthah. Alan, can you tell us a bit about how you've been trying to get into this, this biblical character? I mean, he's quite a complex <laughs> guy, isn't he? Yeah, and from so little text, actually, in the Bible, you know, we're, we're given very few verses uh, in, in Judges about him, but um, Ollie was great about chatting to me before we started rehearsals about some reference points in terms of movies, books, uh, articles, um, plays, Euripides, um, uh, Robert Eggers, you know, these sort of real, real span of, of things. Um, and he, 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 Ollie changed the way I thought about the character and actually see him 40 years, which is actually quite an unsympathetic character. Mm -hmm. You know, he's willing to go through with, with something that is, is so brutal and so against the word of whichever God this is um, that, that, we're, that we're talking about. Um, so, you know, knowing it from Wafter Angels, which I think many people here might, might know as a, as a stand-up piece of music from the opera or the oratorio, that isn't who he is. Um, mm. That's a rare moment of, of reflection and of uh, doubt. The rest of the time, he's, he's a bit of a brute. And how is that working out for you? Um, the, 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 the coat and the, the shoes are helping, yeah. <laughs> No, it, it's very interesting. It's, it's very interesting way to, I, I, you know, again, I said to Ollie very early in rehearsals, it's not what I'm good at. You know, s speaking seriously, coming from Grimes, I find it very easy to be stared at by a room of people and feel very uncomfortable. Um, but to sort of command the room, it's not my natural, my natural character. It's, been, it's stepping out of, of what I, I'm mm. used to and, and what I have made my living from. So. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Jennifer, I guess, are there ways in which Ephus is actually a kind of diametrically opposed character? Jephthah and her father? I think so. I mean, it's interesting because I think the relationship between Jephthah and Iphis, father and daughter, is very close. Um, and, you know, you've also got Storja, her mother, which is, uh, you know, she's a much more emotional character in the piece. So Iphis is like a, um, a kind of mix between the two. She has this staunch belief in her faith, which obviously comes from her dad. You know, she believes in her dad and she believes in the God that her dad has taught her about. Mm. Um, you know, and she, she has extreme strength in the most awful of situations, but she also has this naivety, this vulnerability to her, um, and this, this purity, as, as Cameron was saying, the two of us as the, as the lovers of the piece, um, it juxtaposes a lot of the, the brutality from the other characters, which is really lovely to play. And I've got to say, just the, the journey, the like, arc of the character of Iphis <laughs> is very strong in this piece. And I've just I've really enjoyed just living her life. It's, you know, it's, the action takes place over quite a short amount of time in the oratorio, but the journey is, is really huge that she goes on and uh, she shows great inner strength in the end. Does it feel significant to you that she is, as Ruth Smith said, she's, she's unnamed in the Bible? Mm. Is there a bit of a kind of, some, some lacking information there? Um, I think it's a bit like another opera that Alan and I have both done, the Hamlet, you know, a bit, bit, a bit Ophelia-like in a sense that similarly in Shakespeare, Ophelia doesn't have much to actually say, she doesn't have many words. Um, similarly with the character of Iphis, there's not much about her, but that actually just means that you can delve a little bit deeper into yourself. And, and Ollie's been absolutely incredible at helping me create this really full, real character. She's really real, Iphis, I find. Um, and it is m kind of more fun to play when there isn't an awful lot written or a lot of things that you can look into about her because you can really make her your own. Yeah. No, I can imagine. Wonderful. Cameron, tell us a bit about Haymore, about Ifus's lover. Where does, where does he fit into all this? Um, well, in our production, similarly, we've looked at all of our characters with Ollie as well, trying to see what was maybe obvious and what was less obvious and, and explore all the options. And Haymore in this production is, is a sensitive guy. He's got the heart of a poet, the mind of a philosopher, and he's the hands of a craftsman. And, um, he gets thrown into the situation <clears throat> purely because of his heart. He 
is devoted to IFAS. And given the context, remember that this piece was premiered in Covent Garden in 1752. So at, in that period, one might consider Hamer to be a little bit, uh, to have feminist values or to be quite a uh, woman's supporter and, and, and question why things were done in previous generations and why they couldn't potentially be different in the future. Um, and in this production, Hamor is one who's led by his heart and perhaps gets himself into a situation um, where he might understand this is what is being done, but doesn't understand why violence is used as a solution for supposedly peacemaking or, or moving forward. Um, so I'm, I'm relating to him uh, very much in that case. And with, with Jen being her, her devoted lover, um, Hamor's, Hamor's questioning, was this violence worth it? Was, was the violence worth it in order to win Jen's trust or to win the, the approval of Jephthah? Was the violence worth it for the capturing of the next land? Or, uh, Hamor is led by his values, his heart, his mind, and, and very much uh, a lover. Thank you. Um, Brindley, tell us about Zabel, Jephthah's half-brother. I guess he sort of kicks all this off, really, doesn't he, by recalling Jephthah from exile. Yeah, yeah, at the beginning he sets it off. And, and I, I, I mean, cause in one sense you could see him as somebody who's a little bit dull and a bit boring and a bit religious. Um, but I, I can't really play that. I have to do something that has a lot of humanity. I mean, he's incredibly passionate about the state of things and we need to do something about it. And what fascinates me is the fact that he, 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 unlike he should have done as, uh, as a community that is uh, following God, uh, he really takes things into his hands and says, we've got to do something about this. It must be so. I'm going to, I have a plan. We're going to bring him back. He's going to sort out the Ammonites. And, um, uh, and I, I, he's his big brother. And I'm, that's easy to do because there's quite a bit of time between us. And, um, but I, I like the fact that he's incredibly passionate mm. um, about he wants, he's got to do something. He's got to make this work. And of course, the, he's got the added pressure, the fact he doesn't know if it's going to work at all. or that it's, it, it really is he, um, putting things on the edge. If I remember correctly, you sing the very first line in this opera, don't you? Yeah, it must Tell us be what so. that's like, because most of us, certainly speaking for myself, I've never had to go out there on stage and open my mouth and sing. What's well, we it? always have that when we go out. All of us, every time we think, <clears throat> how's it going to come out tonight? <laughs> there, there's something, because sometimes you can be, you can warm up and think, yeah, it's fine in the room, it's going to be great. And you go out and you go, oh, no. <laughs> it's going to be one of those nights, and then you have nights when you think it's going to be terrible. You go, you think actually that's not so bad. So I think we all have that. You know, it's okay if you're on stage a long time and you've got, you know, you're on and you've got one thing after another, then in a row. But yeah, the first note we sing is always a kind of okay um, <laughs> moment. It's better to get out of the way early. It, I, it is. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's much nicer to be first up, I think. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Interesting. It, it, it's fine. You know, it's what we. We'll be rooting for you. Yeah, nice. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, Alan, you have sung this piece in concert previously at the BBC Proms, and I wonder, I imagine all of you have, you will have sung in concert performances. Can we go back to, to the thing Ruth was talking about, the, the concert performance of the oratorio versus the staging? There were obviously institutional reasons why this piece was written as an oratorio for this theatre. It was to do with the, the season system, um, normal then in 18th century London. but. What difference does it make to you as singers to be part of a whole apparatus with, with big pieces of dangerous machinery and costumes and all that? It, it's, it, it's wonderful I mean, to bring this, this, this piece to stage, which I, I think Handel would have loved to have done. Um, the only problem, I think, for us at some points in the, in the show are that there are bits missing. You know, that there is a, a piece of orchestral music or there's a recit missing where that would link between scenes, but because Handel didn't have to think about that because he was presenting as a concert piece, you didn't have to worry about that. So, so for me, there have been sort of some sort of sharp corners in terms of where the character comes. But then the, the payoff is that you get these sort of operatic moments of the sort of the, the sort of Jephthah's central scenes, I think, before Waft Her Angels in the second and third, end of the second and beginning of the third acts, which shows off uh, Handel's natural uh, drama and his sense of the theatre and the, the, the psychological depth is, is extraordinary. It's so far ahead of its time in terms of operatic or orat even oratorio writing. Well, I mean, there's so much drama in the music, isn't there, as well, that can then be brought out. How have you found being part of the staging here? Well, yeah, I think because it was originally intended as a concert 
concert performance, um, there is so much drama within the, the, the orchestration. And also, unlike a lot of Handel's operas, there's lots of chorus, as Alan mentioned, and they are some of the most beautiful pieces of music in the piece. Um, and, you know, but we get the chance to, to show them as part of an action as well, which, as Alan said, just adds to the drama. But also, the joy of, the joy of singing Handel generally is that it's a slightly smaller orchestra than a lot of the later operas. Um, and for example, I, I know that Lawrence is asking us to sing to the orchestra when we do our Zitzprobers so that they can hear what we're doing, you know, our, our own individual vocal inflections, the things, the little colours that we're creating, because there's so many colours you can create in Handel's music. And the orchestra have the opportunity to copy, to, you know, to incorporate some of those. And that's, that's a really special thing. I love this idea of you, you actually singing to mm. the orchestra. I wanted to ask about how you've been working with Lawrence. Obviously, he is a Baroque specialist. Um, are there particular things that, that you've all been working on together? We'll be talking to him later, but I want to know your side of the story first. Cameron, what have you been working on with him? Um, well... What I would say about the entire team, and particularly about Lawrence, is that there's a great amount of freedom and trust. I think that at this point, we expect that people have done their homework. And so you can use these rehearsals to take various risks, to try things out, to test your personal limits, particularly with the staging that is intense, emotionally intense. You know, my, my challenge is not to cry on stage. Um, and that affects the instrument. And so that might also affect how you ornament, that might affect how you pace a recitative, that might affect how you interact in a duet or a pause that you might take for a rest. You might stretch that a bit further. So to be allowed the freedom to explore that is, is quite a gift because it's not always the case to have that freedom. And to be also allowed with the freedom a level of trust that you are not just showing us what you can do with your instrument because that is nice, but I find it much more interesting to listen to somebody's brain and somebody's imagination. And so that is something that I think we have been working on throughout, and there has been some distance to allow us to explore that, and then probably in the weeks to come, uh, some decision-making to finalize and, and tighten some loose ends. Brindley, I mean, you're used to singing with very big orchestras indeed. This must be a very different feeling. Yeah, it is. I don't think I sing any differently, but I, I'm aware that I, I'm, I can hear a lot more of me than I normally do. So that's why I was talking about the discipline uh, of it. But, uh, but in a way, it's a wonderfully refreshing change for me uh, to do that. I used to sing an awful lot of Handel, uh, but certainly not uh, recently. Um, but I, I, I find this, we've also had a wonderful time rehearsing uh, together and you were saying just to go back we're saying about Lawrence is the fact he does give us the freedom it's very free on stage we've had wonderful rehearsal times it's very very free and we can at least try you can experiment you can uh, and I really like that I love the fact that it's a little bit more um, collaborative, collaborative. Yeah. it's not just about big oh you know it's it's uh, you can you can take some more risks I love that Wonderful. It sounds like your rehearsal room is a really fun place to be, I have to say. <laughs> Do invite us over when you, you know, if you have time. Bring some uh, tissues. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in today at the end of a, a long day of rehearsals. Um, I will release you now, but it's been fascinating to hear about this. Very best wishes for opening night. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, as you've heard, the cast have been hard at work in the rehearsal room over the last few weeks, uh, working for opening night, which is mere weeks away in the future. But now we've had a chance to hear from some of the singers who are bringing this piece to life. Let's hear from the man behind it all, the director of this new production, the director of opera here at the Royal Opera House, Oliver Mears. Hi, Oliver. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Well, um, you've been busy in the rehearsal room. We've already heard this. Yeah, we've uh, been in the studio for four weeks. 
working with the singers, working on character, working on psychology, working on blocking where they're going to be on stage when we get to the performances. And now we're on stage. And, uh, that must be quite a big moment, I would assume, because I mean, a studio for those who haven't seen it, because this is a ballet studio, this isn't yeah. for a rehearsal studio. It's quite a change of space. It is a change, yeah. And I was, um, we, we went on stage for the first time yesterday with the cast, and I was talking to a, another director actually um, afterwards. We were talking about something else, and uh, she said, "Oh, you're on stage," and she said, "It's always so demoralising, isn't it?" And I said, "I, I, I kind of know what she means because." It is a big change from the, the intensity and the proximity of being in the rehearsal studio where you can see people a couple of metres away and then suddenly you're in this big space and you're also having to worry about other things like lighting and whether a bit of scenery is in the right place at the right time and um, whether people can be seen. And um, So, it's yeah, it's always a little bit of a... Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big change, but I it's exciting too. It's exciting to be on stage and to see things in the auditorium for the first well, time. Well, and a reminder that, well, opera or oratorio in this case, is yeah. it's multimedia. You're adding in the layers of all the different things that Yeah, make it exactly. Off. And that's um, the opportunity, I think, with Handel Oratorios. I mean, as, as Ruth Smith said earlier, uh, it is widely known as uh, the opera of the mind, which is um, a very eloquent description, I think, of what it is. But the potential for these pieces, that they can also be proper operas on stage and it's been remarked before that his strongest oratorios like Semele or Theodora or Jephthah, Saul, are actually sometimes a lot stronger than some of his operas, than many of his operas actually, um, because there is a rarely excess fat. I mean they're, they're often a lot shorter and this is about two and a half hours plus interval so it's um, three hours which is quite rare for Handel. And, uh, and of course, you've got these wonderful choruses as well. Mm. So the fact that Han was um, writing for concert performances meant that he had to employ many more devices to achieve variety than he would have to do on, uh, in, in, in a normal opera performance. Now, this is effectively the latest in a series of Handel operas or oratorios here at Covent Garden, which yeah. were actually written for Covent Garden. Is yeah. that, has that been an intentional... It, it was actually, I think, going right back to my interview for the, one of my interviews for this place. Uh, and I think it really came down to my conception of what this institution should do in terms of its status as an opera house, which is to connect as far as possible with its intrinsic identity, you know, what makes it different to any other opera house in the world. And we always claim we're the greatest opera house in the world, well, we are, obviously. Um, but that, there are other opera houses, I'm afraid, who also claim the same thing. So we have to have something which um, differentiates us from, from them. And there are lots of things that do. The fact that we're in London, this great cosmopolitan city, the, our origins post-war in that era of great social idealism. Um, but also these artists who were very especially associated with Covent Garden. And obviously Benjamin Britten is one of those people um, and Handel is as well. And Handel is London's greatest composer. Uh, I think we can claim him just about. And um, he did also write these magnificent works for the first theatre on, on, on this sign. I think that's really exciting you know, to feel that electricity in the air and the ghost in the atmosphere when you're making a piece like this for the first time here in nearly 300 years. So I think it's overdue that these pieces are done because they are masterpieces and Theodora, Berenice, um, Jephtha, they haven't been staged, they haven't been performed here since, since they were first written. So that's very exciting for us. Yeah. Really exciting. I wonder why Jephtha next? Why, why this piece now? Um, well, when I was kind of drawing up the list of the pieces that we should prioritise, obviously the, uh, the, the, one of the priorities is looking at those pieces that hadn't been staged here for a very long time um, or performed here for, for hundreds of years, um, but also their intrinsic quality. And uh, I actually went to see Alan in that prom that he did um, in 2019, I think it was, and I, I knew the piece quite well already because I'd seen the Katie Mitchell production and I'm a big Handel fan. Um, but to hear Alan do it in performance was um, another, another notch up altogether. So it was a piece that I think has so many special resonances because it was essentially Handel's final piece. I mean, he wrote some um, cobbled together works um, after that, most of which was material that had already been written. Um, so this is his final masterpiece. And it is, I think, one of his very greatest works um, in every respect, in terms of the choral writing, in terms of the vocal writing, the orchestration, the variety, the melodies. Um, it's got everything. And it's also got a great story, it's very theatrical as well. I mean, there's so much drama in it. And so for a director like me, it's, it's a gift, really. Do you remember what first drew you 
to the piece, or in fact your first encounter with it, presumably quite a long time ago from the way you talk about it? Um, well, the first time I saw it in performance was, as I say, the Katie Mitchell production, which she um, did for Welsh National Opera. It was a great production and very different to ours. And, um, and I could see all of the potential that there were, was in the piece for theatre, first of all, but I was, also, I was also struck by the beauty of the choruses and um, also the delineation of the characters. All of the characters are so strongly drawn and um, moving in their own way. And they go on such, as Jane was saying, such um, journeys, arcs, um, that there's a, a, a huge amount of rich material there, I think, um, for a director and, and, a, and a conductor and for the performers themselves. And it's, um, it's been great working with them because they just love the piece so much, I can tell that. And they do it so well and so naturally um, that, that it makes for, as they were saying, a very happy experience, yeah. yeah. These are huge themes. I mean, that begins to sound like an understatement, I think, for a work like this. Mm. How did you start to put together the production without giving away anything you're not willing to tell us? Well, uh, the, the, the first approach really is to listen to it over and over and over and over again until you know it inside out. Uh, this is from, I'm speaking for myself now. Um, and then to read around uh, as much as possible. And obviously there is the Euripi Euripides um, play, which is a big influence on this production, and in particular the end of the, 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 the show, which we talked a little bit before, the, uh, the Deus Ex Machina, the arrival of the angel, or angel as we call, call him in this show. Um, and so the play was a big influence. Uh, this idea of a religious charismatic figure. I mean, Alan talked a little bit about those conversations that we had. We were looking at things like Scientology and David Koresh and Waco and um, Jim Jones um, and also older historical figures like Savranola, uh, Oliver Cromwell um, and the kind of resonances that there are across the centuries with people like that and the cults or the religious movements that they lead. That was a big, big influence. And um, the more reading research you do and listening, things start to kind of percolate and emerge in your mind. And of course, that early conversation that one has with one's designers, um, set designer, costume designer, lighting designer, particularly lighting designer um, in this show, um, were, were also very inspiring because they all brought their own ideas and um, imagery and thoughts, inspirations. Um, and once we were on that, that particular track of wanting it to have the resonance of, uh, of a Greek tragedy, you know, that kind of primal energy um, which those plays do have um, and also the idea that it was very much rooted in Handel's life his own experiences of profound suffering mental and physical debilitation which he was experiencing towards the end of his life his, his, his final work um, and uh, and then this idea of Handel being positioned in the middle of the enlightenment and what that means in a piece like this which is all about the idea of a religious figure you know this religious figure who in a sense, um, starts to believe his own publicity and goes completely off the deep end. And because of the hubris um, that he represents, he is then inevitably, as happens in Greek tragedy, punished. But that is also very much related to those, um, to those ideas about enlightenment, what is truth, what is reason, um, what is a lack of enlightenment. And in the 18th century, that very much meant fanaticism. It meant um, not questioning. It meant following things blindly without... Um, investigating without questioning, without exploring. And I think that that's why Handel is a great figure of the Enlightenment, because he asks us to, to question what are the motives of this man. Um, he thinks he believes in God, um, but does he really? Is he doing it for his own reasons? Is he doing it for his own personal, um, yeah, his own, his own personal motivations? Uh, and I think that questioning is, is a real opportunity, I think, to, to mine. Well, it also sounds as though it works so well with your creative process, which does sound so kind of dialogic, so collaborative, mm. that you've got this team you've worked with before, yeah. Rigoletto in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is the same team again you've got here. Yeah, it? it's um, uh, it, it, almost exactly the same team, um, apart from different conductor, of course. Lawrence is conducting. Um, and no, it's, it's, it's great because there is a kind of a very high level of trust. I mean, most of these people I've been working with for, in some cases, decades. Um, like Simon Holdsworth and um, so I, we know each other very well and there's a kind of shorthand, there's a vocabulary and um, there's a lot of trust as well so that you can have the conversations and you say that you have an idea and they say that's a terrible idea uh, <laughs> and you can just say it and no one gets offended and, uh, and that way I think you can really create yeah, hopefully interesting work. Fabulous. Well, rather than talking more about collaboration, let's see it in action. Um, I would love to bring to the stage now Lawrence Cummings so that we can hear a little bit more about where the music fits into all this. Please welcome him now. Mm. 
Welcome, Lawrence. Thank you. I can't believe this is your main stage debut. It is, yes. How's that, how's that feel? Um, well, uh, honestly, you spend the first week having imposter syndrome. I think, can this really be where I'm supposed to be? And, and uh, not helped, I have to say, by this building where you usually aren't where you're supposed to be. Um, and it's almost <laughs> impossible to find where you are supposed to be. So several ballet dancers have helped me out. <laughs> I, I've discovered the best way is to make your way to the canteen because I know my way to most places from the canteen. <clears throat> so even if that means going up five floors and then along and then down another six, it's still the easiest way to do it. And you might get cake on the way, you never well, know. Well, yes, and have eaten it by the time you arrive, yes. Brilliant. Um, without wishing to add to the sense of pressure, I mean, Handel conducted this, didn't he, himself, originally at Covent Garden Theatre. <laughs> In what sense are you trying not to add to the <laughs> pressure? <laughs> yes, um, Mark Packwood, our fabulous uh, repetitor who's uh, playing in the production rehearsals and also playing harpsichord in the, in the main piece, made that observation to me at the end of the first week. You do realise the last person who conducted this piece here was Handel himself. <laughs> yeah. So, You'll be fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm not nervous. No, it's fine. Um, Ollie, tell us about how Lawrence got involved. My understanding of how these things work, I mean, presumably you, you got there first. Um, well, obviously, I mean, Lawrence is a, is a very significant, significant figure in the, um, especially the Baroque scene, and has a very uh, distinguished um, record in, in that department, and, and I'm very well aware of his work, um, both live and on record. Um, but I, the, our first direct contact was when Lawrence conducted Berenice, which is one of the pieces that, again, hadn't been performed here since the 1730s. And um, I thought that the work that he did on that with um, Adele was really magnificent and um, inspiring, exciting, and all the things that you want Handel conducting to be. Because when, I have to say, maybe more than any other composer, when it's um, not well conducted, it can be so deathly dull, Handel, unfortunately. So you really need that flair, and, and, and that's what, what Lawrence brings in spades. So it was a natural um, next step, I think, after um, Berenice to, to, to work with him on this. And Berenice was in the Limbury Theatre, mm. hence the main stage thing. I can confirm that Lawrence's CV is indeed extraordinary. I've got lines and lines and lines of intro text <laughs> here, which I won't um, bother you all with, but you are, among other things, uh, music director of the Academy of Ancient Music and music director of the London Handel Festival at the moment. Dare I ask, how did you end up specialising in Baroque music, becoming a harpsichordist? Um, well, I was destined to be an organist. I, I trained as an organist first and foremost. I sang in my local parish choir, um, got into church music. Um, then I really saw myself in, in a cloistered environment, in a cathedral. Um, and I was very lucky I got to be an organ scholar at um, Oxford. And that gave me a window into what it's like to be part of a... a an institution like that, which I loved, but I realized I was going to all these lectures that were really exciting me. It was the, the late 80s, and historical performance was just really burgeoning. And I then started to experiment with the harpsichord, and I just fell in love with the repertoire. And from then on, I just decided that, that, that that's what I had to do. So I, I effectively retrained in a way. I mean, I sort of Carry, I do still play the organ, but um, I, I moved over to the harpsichord, specialised in that, and went to the Royal College of Music, and then um, subsequently worked with um, Jill Severs, who's a wonderful teacher, and just immersed myself in that, that, um, that musical language. And, um, I mean, how I got really into Handel was I was just very, very lucky. Um, James Conway, who was currently um, then running Opera Theatre Company, based in Dublin, but it was a touring company, um, contacted me and said, would I like to be part of an Irish tour of Handel's Tamilano? Um, and I just thought that was the most marvellous idea ever. Um, put the harpsichord in the back of my Vauxhall Cavalier estate, <laughs> went over on the ferry and toured round rural Ireland, the, the, the major cities as well, um, performing this wonderful Handel music. And of course the audiences loved it. And we, we were just, it was, it, was, it was heaven. So that's how I got started. Wonderful. Well, it seems only fair since I did ask Ollie. Do you remember when you first came across Jepsa? Well, I mean, I think um, it was mentioned earlier that, that the first aria I ever heard from it, well, in fact, the first aria I ever sang from it, because that's when I first heard it, was uh, Waft Her Angels. When, of course, I sang it, I think, when I was a, 17-year-old tenor, 
really having no clue about what the text was that I was saying. I mean, I don't think you, you know, I did understand what the words meant and I knew the story, but I mean, the, the message is, is so intense and the, the story that leads up to it. I mean, it was a wonderful introduction to it. And then since then, I've had the great fortune to conduct it in, in a concert um, version for the London Handel Festival. In fact, we did it um, on the, the death day in 2009 to celebrate the uh, 250 years since the death of Handel. And in fact, um, with Yestin Davis, we even broadcast on Radio 3 in Handel House at 8 o'clock in the morning, which is supposed to be the time that uh, he died. So um, uh, that, that was the last, that was the, really the last time I did it. But it's so that's Wonderful. And now you're back with, with deathly machinery. I mean, this machinery is getting more and more dangerous <laughs> in my head now that Alan mentioned it. I wonder, could you tell us a bit, both of you, about how you've been working together in rehearsals so far? Ollie, do you want to... Um, well, I mean, I think it's probably worth saying that we didn't just start working in rehearsals. I mean, we had a really, um, we've had a lot of dialogue over the last year or so, um, talking about, you know, particular problems or moments in the text or, or the music that needed discussion, but also we had a long meeting in the summer, which was um, where we just went through the whole piece. And um, that was great, actually, just to be able to talk about our ideas for each scene and what we thought about the characters and um, uh, any cuts that we wanted to make as well. Um, and that was really fantastic. And um, uh, in, in the room, um, Lawrence had already done a lot of the work with the singers on the first day in, in a long music call. And actually, I think it's, um, it's been very easy. I mean, from, from my point of view, it's been great, very um, positive and, and collaborative and, yeah. Well, and indeed, of course, um, you very kindly were interested in my views on the casting in the, in the first place. So that's, I yeah. suppose, when we yeah. were also talking about character, who, what sort of singer we were looking for for all the roles, and I have to say, we, um, you know, we aced that bit. So that, that's that's really good. And uh, uh, the, the trust, the word trust, has come up a lot in in the process, and I think it it has to be there, and and that's the lovely thing, and also um, the ability to be able to say, I don't think that's a good idea. You know, that's that's uh, I don't suppose we're quite as um, honest with each other as perhaps you are with Simon, um, but um, the. Uh, it's, it's lovely to have that feeling because, and Jen mentioned it earlier, that for the singers, I mean, it, it's chamber music. You know, we may be in a very, very big hall, but this is all chamber music. So, um, and just to clarify, when we're doing the, the Zitz Proben this week, which is the Zitz Proben is when you do, it's a sitting rehearsal, literally, so that the singers just sing, they don't do the staging. Um, and ordinarily in opera, the singers have to go behind the orchestra and I hate that because they're so far away and it's nothing like it will be on stage because although they're behind the orchestra literally, they're also above the orchestra. So there's a sort of um, triangular thing that goes on with, with you, the audience, as well. So that's the sort of convection current that's going around the room. So uh, we're having it set up so that they will be singing, the orchestra will be on one side of the room and the singers will be singing towards. So they're playing and singing to each other. And that's, that's great for the uh, chamber music antennae, which have to be twitching because everyone has to just be listening so carefully and responding. Um, <clears throat> so that's the, that's the exciting stage we're at. It starts tomorrow. Wonderful. Ollie, are there particular challenges in staging this work? Evidently there are challenges of staging any opera or oratorio, but are there particular things that have come to light with this one? Um, well, I mean, I think that often the, the choruses are a, a challenge. When you first l open the score um, of a piece like this, and you just uh, pages and pages and pages of chorus, and there, is, <laughs> there isn't anything necessarily dramatic that's happening. The chorus is just singing more or less the same text for four or five minutes. And as a director, you have to think of something that's going to move the drama along and engage people in that time. It can't just be a, a concert moment. Um, but actually, it's extremely skillfully written and dramatically written. I think that one of the, um, the moments that we, um, we've been talking about a lot in the last few days, which is a, kind of, which is a dramaturgical problem, I think, in the piece, um, which is there is this, the, obviously, the, the famous vow where um, he says that uh, whoever he sees when he gets back from um, the war, he's going to sacrifice. Um, and, um, and of course, he, 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 he uh, encounters his daughter, Iphis, when he gets back home. Um, but before that, between the battle and when he sees his daughter Iphis, there's an enormous chorus scene um, when he sees lots and lots of other people. Uh, and he sees Zabel and he sees Haymore. Um, and so somewhat, somehow one's got to make sense of that and then make the moment of the meeting as impactful as it should be. And, but I think that's really the only moment where you kind of think that's, 
awkward um, dramatically, and we're still trying to fix it this week, actually, and, and, and make it work. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's, it's a great joy to work on um, as, a, as a piece of theatre as much as a piece of music. Lawrence, you looked as though you might have a solution right up your sleeve just there. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, but it was just to say uh, there are one or two moments, um, and you find this when you're staging any of the um, oratorios or musical dramas. I was um, working on Handel's Hercules in Frankfurt earlier this year with Barry Kosky. And there are, in that, the whole opera starts with something that is obviously exposition. So the, the first character, Lycas, comes on stage and says, she weeps. Look, mourning her, waiting for her husband, and you think, well, you don't really need to say that because she's sitting there. It's very clear what she's doing. We don't quite have it. It's not as bold as that, but th this scene that Ollie was just describing is, is, is very similar to that in the sense that you have to suspend belief in a way um, or at least find a solution, which is what we're in the middle of doing, um, because, of course, the contemporary audience would have just accepted it because they would have known that they were listening to a chorus in their heads. They weren't actually witnessing them. And there is a, there's a big difference between the sort of visual and the, and the um, imaginary. Of course, thank you. I'm very aware you're grasping the score um, and that there is much to say about this music specifically. I wonder, do we need a repertoire back again? to do this or yes, that would, would be that be helpful? In that case, let's hail Edward Reeve all over again. Thank you so much, Edward. <clears throat> Now, I wonder whether, to start us off, Lawrence, could you tell us a little bit more about the difference between opera and oratorio, straightforwardly? We, we've already gathered that oratorio was written in the first instance not to be staged. Opera, of course, is. Is there more to it than that in musical terms? Well, for Handel specifically, I mean, that's because that's a big topic, uh, but for Handel specifically, I think, um, as Ruth touched on earlier, in the operas that Handel wrote, they're, they're part of a, a genre called opera seria, which had very strict conventions. Um, and that is to say, um, it's a little bit like a laboratory experiment. You, you set certain characters, and they have a recitative, so they speak in stile recitativo, which is a spoken style but sung. So you're, you're, you've got the dialogue, basically. You've got the, the plot unfolding in the recitatives. And um, then the character... It's like the, the, the recitative bubbles up into such a situation that something has to be expressed that's beyond words. So they sing an aria, and that's obviously a, an emotional, rhetorical way of de, um, getting inside the character and, and getting inside their head. And then in this very strict convention... It's a da capo aria, which is to say you have an A section, a B section, and then you go back to the head of the aria, a da capo, back to the A. And then in Handel's time, it would have been ornamented by the singer uh, to give variety. Then said singer exits. And that happens throughout the whole course of the, of the opera. Um, with the oratorios, um, you don't have that convention. Handel breaks a lot of the rules. Um, I was just going to ask... If Edward would play, um, he doesn't know what I'm going to ask him, by the way. So it's uh, Zabel's first aria. Um, just could you play just a, a few, few bars? So this is the opening. It's called the ritornello, which is to say that the, the theme that returns all the time. And it's what punctuates the singing. So just a few bars would be lovely. <laughs> I think that deserves a round of applause myself. <laughs> so then, Brindley, who you've heard being very modest about his vocal prowess, he's amazing in this aria. He launches, it's like sort of setting something aflame at the beginning of the show. Um, and then there's a B section, which is in the contrasting key. Could you just give us a few bars of the D minor? There's a, a different affect, a different mood that's portrayed there. And then, ordinarily, you have the adagio at the end of the B section. And the contemporary audience would still be sort of expecting a return to the opening music. But no. Here we get... a big chorus! It's 
a brilliant device because um, obviously uh, here in this particular oratorio, the chorus don't have the fun that they sometimes get, which is to be different sets of people. It's a challenge to stage because of course they have to get into different costumes, usually contrasting costumes in a very short space of time. But here they're Israelites throughout. But this first chorus is saying, no more to Ammon's God and King, Fierce Moloch shall our symbols ring. These are the two, two um, gods, pagan gods for us. Um, uh, and so Handel gets to portray these pagan gods with that, again, rhetorical technique of saying, well, we're not going to have any more of this. Listen to this fun, no more of that. Because the next section is a jig. And we're not going to have any more of that. No more fun. And then um, for the final section, um, the, the trumpets, and in our case, the drums, uh, come in as well. So it's, it's a sort of a rounding, a rounding off. So, so it's structurally, he feels much more free. I mean, um, much ink has been written on why it is that um, Handel moved towards oratorio. Um, one of the things I think that is very striking is that he obviously, for whatever reason, did not want to um, go with the prevailing taste, which, which there was a hunger for opera in English. Um, and he, for whatever reason, didn't want to do that. He didn't, he didn't want to move away from the opera seria convention. I think possibly you could argue because he loved limitations. You know, any, any great artist does really, really well if they're limited in some capacity, you know. But what he did, of course, give us is these wonderful biblical stories um, in English. Uh, so that, as, as much has been said about having the chorus in, it adds just a totally different dimension. So uh, it gives us lots and lots of colour to play with. I am very aware that time is ticking away and we've got one more thing to fit into this, but I will ask one more question of you, Lawrence, which is you're going to be conducting at the harpsichord, is that right? How do you combine those two things for those of us, again, who don't spend our daytimes in pits? Yes, well, um, the orchestra is... We, we, we've, we've got quite a sizable orchestra because obviously it's a big house. Um, but, I mean, Handel himself had 22 violins, so it's not really true that he had small-scale things. He liked, he liked sound. Um, we have the orchestra, which you, you would definitely all recognise, you know, the violins, the, the violas, the cellos, the basses. Um, we have winds. Um, in fact, in this production, we're doubling up the winds, so we've got four oboes, two bassoons. Um, and then we have trumpets, they're playing natural trumpets and, and timpani, and then horns. So that, 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 those are the sort of that, those are the, um, the, the things he had in his toolbox, in his uh, play pen, if you like. Um, and then, then you have the continuo team. And I was talking earlier about the restatives, the, this thing of, of telling the story through spoken word rather than through song. So it's, it's sort of quasi uh, spoken, but, but to notes. And that's accompanied by the continuo section who play throughout. Um, and Handel himself directed from the keyboard. Conducting hadn't been invented yet. So um, the, the idea of conductor as interpreter was, was not, not prevailing. Um, I mean, I'm sure that's not to say that Handel didn't have many, many opinions about how he wanted it done. And in fact, we know we have stories about the, the, that. But the, the sort of modern way of conducting and the idea of interpreting would not have been pre prevailing with them. They, they, they um, just had someone making the beat happen. And um, in fact, the, the reason we have a bat on the white stick comes from the fact that it started off as a rolled up piece of paper so that everyone could see it. So it's just really a, a, a way of giving the tactus, giving them the measure. Um, but uh, he, Handel also had two harp scores, so it's quite possible that he, he moved away from playing himself in order to help gestures and, and things. So we have two harpsichords. We have a, a cello and a double bass. They're also playing in, and we all play the same line from the bass line. And then the harpsichords, and then the two theorbos, which some of you will have seen. They're the lutes with the giant necks. Um, and they, they were an instrument that was invented in the 17th century as a way of accompanying the first opera um, in Italy. Um, and it was actually, in a sense, that, like a modern foldback. It's a way of the singers being able to hear what was going on. So the long strings are non-fretted. They're just pitched strings. 
and you can sort of thwack them out and then make a big, loud chord using the stops of the upper strings. Um, so we have this sort of big combination of harmony because the harmony in Handel, but I mean in Baroque music in general, is the driving force. It's the engine of the whole production. So we have that um, dr driving us forward. Thank you, Lawrence. I feel as though we could talk for hours, and I'm pretty sure we could, but unfortunately it is almost time to wrap up. But we have got the chance to hear one more piece of music, I think. Would you mind introducing it for us, please? Yes, well, Paul is going to sing Jephthah's first aria. Now, Alan was talking earlier about hubris, and this is hubris writ large. Um, so you, you've already had this, the scene set for you. Um, Jephthah has been away, and he's brought back by his elder stepbrother, Zabel, and um, he does a rather marvellous thing, which is that Zabel says, will you, will you lead our country? And he said, I will, so long as, if I win, the terms will carry on being the same. In other words, I can be leader for longevity. And then he sings this aria, and I'm just going to read out the text, because you, you'll see what um, Ollie was saying about certain things lasting a lot longer when you put them to music. Um, Virtue my soul shall still embrace. Goodness shall make me great. Who builds upon this steady base dreads no event of fate. Now, I know we're short of time, but I just want to... Virtue was a huge buzzword. That was, that was the thing that, that was you know, part of this move to enlightenment. Virtue my soul shall still embrace. I, I'm already virtuous. So that's an element of uh, self-love there. Goodness shall make me great. So, you know, the, the arrogance to know that he is good and knows how to be good. And then there's a marvellous musical thing that happens in the B section. So I'm just going to prevail on Edward one more time. To, if you could... Um, because the next piece of text is who builds upon this steady base. Now, we've been talking about the continuo, the bass line, the basso continuo. Um, so you'd think that when you get to talk about a steady bass, the bass would be prominent. But in fact, in this handle setting, the bass totally drops out. So if you could just perhaps play a couple of bars into it. Who builds upon this steady bass dreads no event of fate. Now, if that doesn't do warning signs, I don't know what does. So now Paul's going to sing the aria, I believe. Brilliant, thank you. Please welcome Paul Hopkins. Oh. 
on this steady pace Dreads no event of fate Dreads no event of fate Fur my soul shall still embrace Goodness shall make me great Goodness shall make me great shall still embrace, goodness shall make me great. But all my soul shall still embrace, goodness shall make me great. And the goodness, goodness shall make me great. Goodness shall make me great, shall make me great. Thank you so much, Paul and Edward. I think it's fair to say self-satisfaction has really sounded so appealing. What a way to end this evening. Um, that is it for tonight's Insight, I'm afraid. Thank you to Ollie and Lawrence and to all of our guests this evening for joining us. You can, of course, buy your tickets for Jephthah online as we speak. Uh, the curtain will go up on the 8th of November. Be there. Uh, in the meantime, thank you to everyone here in the Claw studio who's joined us for tonight's Insight, and of course to everybody who's been watching at home for this Insight, supported by Rolex. Good night. <laughs>